Welcome to our uh, webinar this morning. Welcome to our class, uh, Intellectual Property Basics. I'm Mike Bendrup with the Small Business Education Program at the uh, University of Nevada, Reno Extension. And we're gonna talk about some basics to intellectual property you need to know for your business today. So here's the outline of what we're going to be talking about uh, today. We're going to talk about uh, the history of intellectual property, why uh, legal precedents for why we have it. We're going to talk about copyright, trademarks, patents, and also trade secrets. So intellectual property history comes from literally the foundation of the United States government, right? So it's, uh, we find the legal basis for intellectual property was contained in our is contained in our Constitution. Article One, Section Eight reads: Congress shall have power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to, re to their respective writings and discoveries. The founding fathers saw that it was so important that we had this these rights protected that they actually come from our Constitution. Okay. So with that being said, it's important and it's important to know these things uh, so that you can protect yourself, your business, your assets, and to make sure that you're not infringing and that you're making sure that you get, um, you, you get the protections that you need for your business. So first we're gonna talk about copyright today. So copyright law, as I said, has been part of US law since the nation's founding. Congress passed the first uh, laws about copyright in 1790. And it's one of the areas of law that they keep updated throughout the years to keep up with the times, okay? So it still is a very relevant thing. Uh, we, we, see, we see new cases all the time and they hit the media. Uh, copyright's important and it's important to know these things. So what is copyright? Copyright essentially protects original works of authorship. As soon as the author and the word is fixes the work in a tangible form. What this means is uh, as soon as you create something in a physical tangible form, it's fixed and it's considered as long as it's an original work from from an author. Um, it is cop it, there's an inherent copyright to it. So what can you copyright. A lot of stuff, okay? Paintings, photos, illustrations, books, poems, even blog posts, right? Musical compositions, sound recordings, computer code, movies, architectural works, plays, and much, much more. Anything that you can create and record or fix is, uh, is subject to copyright. Now, what does it mean by original works? Original works have to be created independently by a human author, okay? Um, they have to have a minimal degree of creativity. I know that sounds kind of funny when you hear that. It has to be minimally creative, um, not copied from other works, okay? So the Supreme Court says uh, that it must have a spark and modicum of creativity. So just a little bit, it has to be at least a little creative uh, to be original and created by a human author. So those, that's what an original work is. Fixed works. So what does it mean to be fixed? It means that it's sufficiently captured in a permanent medium, okay? So it needs to be perceivable. You have to be able to look at it and say, yeah, that, that's something, right? It has to be able to be reproduced. It has to be able to be communicated in order to be fixed. A work is generally fixed when you write it down or you record it. That's what a fixed work is. Okay, so who owns copyright? We all do. Everyone is a copyright owner. When you create an original work and you fix it, most of us today will write something. We'll write something down. If we write a thought, if we write a poem, if we write some lyrics to a song, if you go home tonight, you pick up your guitar and you write some music and you write that down, you write the notes down, what you wrote or some lyrics to that, you own copyright. If you take a picture, if you write a poem, record a song, you're the author and the owner of that copyright. Copyright is inherent when you create something. So who else owns copyright? Companies, organizations, and other people besides the works creator can also be copyright owners. Now this includes works for hire, independent contractors, 
and commissioned works, okay? So for example, uh, in the advertising business, if I'm a graphic designer, I may work for an advertising agency, right? And one of my jobs may be to create logos for clients. When I create a logo for a client, I'm creating it for and in behalf of that organization that employs me, right? So who owns copyright to that logo? The organization that hired me, okay? So the company that hired me, even though they didn't, the company themselves didn't create it or the owner may not have created it because I created it while being a work for hire or an independent contractor, they actually own the copyright. Same thing if you have somebody, you commission a work to be done for you, whoever owns that commission owns the copyright, not necessarily the artist, okay? You can also receive copyrights from wills and bequests, okay? So for instance, if you have someone who leaves you a collection of original art, let's say in a, uh, uh, in a will or they bequest it to you uh, legally, you are now the copyright holder of that artwork, okay? My grandfather was a painter and I own four paintings that he did. I own the copyright to those paintings and I can reproduce them as I wish. So what does copyright provide for you? Um, what rights do you have as a holder of a copyright? Okay, you can reproduce the work in either copies or what they call phono records. Now, what's a phono record? Phono record is literally anything you can take a you can take a sound recording right it's a record a compact disc a reel-to-reel -reel tape a, a cassette tape a thumb drive anything that you can copy or put that work onto becomes a phono record okay you can prepare derivative works based upon the work we often see artists that create musical creations may release a uh an extended mix of the song or an album or something of that nature so you can take something and then make derivative works based upon the original work. You can also distribute copies or those phono records of the work to the public by sale uh, or other transfer of ownership. So you can rent them, you can lease them, you can lend them out, you can license them. So once you own copyright, you can do a lot of different things with it, okay? So uh, copyright also provides you uh, three, three things. You can perform the work publicly. So if this is a, a play, a uh, musical, a uh, choreographic work, even a pantomime or a motion picture or audiovisual work, you have the right to perform that work publicly. You also have the right to display work publicly as well with those above mentioned things, but also if it's graphical, if it's sculpture, um, it also applies to individual images of a motion picture or audiovisual work, okay? So who owns copyright to a single frame? Uh, most films are produced at 24 frames per second. Uh, videos captured at 30 frames per second, typically. Uh, those images that are captured are still subject to copyright. So people, if I wanted to make a poster, for example, of one of the Marvel movies, I wanted to take uh, make a poster of Thor, right, from one of the Marvel movies. I take an image from one of those movies, and that image is subject to copyright. I'd have to pay licensing fees to the original holder of that copyright in order to produce that those posters also copyright holders have the ability to perform the work publicly by means of a audio transmission if the work is a sound recording right so you can you can play the sounds uh, publicly uh, as long as you hold copyright to those it also provides the owner of the copyright the right to authorize others to exercise these exclusive rights is subject to certain statutory limitations, okay? So you can always grant rights to use things uh, if you are the copyright holder. Okay, so how long does copyright last? And the, uh, the, the very uh, convoluted answer is it depends, right? Whenever we ask legal questions, the answer is usually, well, it depends. So. If you created the work on or after the 1st of January, 1978, typically the copyright term is the life of the creator plus 70 years after the author's death. Okay, so that's probably the minimum amount of time before it falls into what we call the public domain. Okay, if the work is created jointly, there's two or more authors for it. 
the term lasts 70 years after the last surviving author's death. So if you have five people got together and they created, uh, for example, music, this happens a lot with uh, artists or bands, uh, who owns the copyright to that? It doesn't slip into the public domain until all of the authors have been dead, uh, the last one, 70 years after the last one's uh, death. So for works that are made on an anonymous basis, copyright protection is 95 years from publication or 120 years from the creation, whichever is shorter. And if you had works that were created before January 1st of 1978, there's a whole different time frame, which we're not even gonna talk about here because we're specifically talking about stuff that you create in your business and, and things that are relevant within our lifetime. So that's how long it lasts. So can I use works that are not mine. Of course we can. We all use copyright. Uh, we all use works that are, aren't ours every single day. Okay. And how do we do this? We do this with uh, three things. There's agreements, there's exceptions, and there's limitations. Okay. An agreement, you can buy something that's copyrighted and then it's yours and you can use it, or you can, you can purchase a license uh, of, of a work. Very common application of this are stock photos, right? You want to use a photo on your website, you can go and you can get a license from any of the stock photo companies. And for a fee, they will allow you to use their work for a period of time uh, with limitations on what you can do, okay? So you can license that. If you want to use audio, uh, you, you're making some videos, you want to use audio in your videos, you can go on and you can uh, license an audio composition for your video. Now there might be limitations like you can only use it online or maybe you can only use it in print or you can only use it in a certain geographic part of the country or world, okay? Those are limitations to the license and it's okay. So some exceptions to uh, using works that aren't yours. One is fair use. And this is, this is one that gets uh, a lot of, uh, I guess, people have a lot of questions about fair use. So fair use is you can use a work if you're, if, if you're being critical of it. So if you're, you're, you're critiquing a movie, for example, you might be able to show clips of that movie if you're making a critique video that talks about it. So criticism is fair use, okay? Um, you can comment on this. If you're making comment, if you're doing a news report, if you're teaching uh, at a nonprofit institution, you can utilize things that are copyrighted in your teaching practices. In scholarship or also in research, that is not an infringement of copyright, okay? So fair use uh, usually is one claim to copyright. So if you, if you get flagged, let's say you put a YouTube video up and you get flagged for some kind of copyright infringement, maybe the music that's in there is, okay? So you have, uh, you have a couple of defenses. One is I own a license to this work, right? And you have to prove that you have the license to use that song. Also, it could be a work where you're criticizing it. So that's fair use. That can, constitutes fair use as far as, as, as you know. If you're, if you're pulling up a song and you're tearing the song apart and being critical of the musicianship of the song, that's considered fair use, okay? First sale doctrine, simply means if I buy a CD or a recording of something, um, I, I, I am able to sell that to somebody else. I'm not selling the copyright, but I can sell that without the person buying it having to pay a royalty or a licensing to the original owner. That's all that first sale doctrine means is that you can, you can sell these. Uh, if I buy something and the copyright is inherent into that product, I can sell it without uh, transferring the copyright or having to pay any sort of uh, fees to that. And the last one is public domain. If things are in the public domain, meaning either they weren't copyrighted at some point or the copyright slipped in the public domain because of the age of it. Uh, so sometimes very old things are in the public domain. These are old writings, newspapers, old, old photos and things like that because we said if the author has been dead for 70 years, this slips into the public domain. One great example of this is our world famous Las Vegas sign, right? The Las Vegas sign was created years ago 
and the design of the sign was never copyrighted, so it slipped into the public domain. So now anybody can use this design without having to pay a licensing fee or a royalty or anything. And so that's why we see the sign all over the place. If you wanted to create bottled water well, with the Welcome to Las Vegas sign artwork right on it, you're totally uh, okay to do that. There's no limitations to using that artwork in representation to the city. If you want to make little light up signs and sell them at Walgreens, you can go right ahead and do that without having to pay that. Now, if you're trying to put Mickey Mouse on a bottle of water, you have to pay a licensing fee to use that image because that is not in the public domain, okay? So you can, you can see stuff that's in the public domain and you can use that very freely, but this is one way that we use works that are not ours. Okay, so copyright registration. Copyright is not mandatory. Copyright's inherent when you create anything. If you're a creator, the second you design something, the second you make something, write something, record something, that's inherent. You own the copyright on this, okay? We've often heard of the poor man's copyright where you mail yourself a letter or whatever. Don't do that. That's not acceptable, right? It's not mandatory, but we recommend it for your works, right? Because, Mike, yes, sir. And I know that's a very common myth out there. Common myth. That you have to register your copyright, otherwise you don't own it. It, it is not copyrighted. But uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting point. There's no registration needed. It is voluntary. The copyright is automatic now and i would recommend uh you know you have your website for your business you should put copyright all all rights reserved and put it on your website with uh, 2021 on there with that little c and the circle you own copyright to that now did you register it uh you don't have to register it however if you're going to litigate if you're going to go to court over this and and protect your copyright from, uh, if you're gonna sue somebody for infringing upon it, you need it in order to properly litigate, okay? Because it allows owners to seek certain types of monetary damages and also attorney's fees uh, from the person. So if somebody's infringing on your copyright, you go to court, if you're not registered, if the copyright is not registered, um, it limits the amount of damages you can seek and you can't seek attorney's fees either. The other thing that it does is it it facilitates licensing. If you're if you're a you're a photographer, you take pictures, you put them up online. If somebody wants to use that picture and they see that you've copyrighted that picture, they can approach you and say, "Hey, I'd love to use this on the cover of our magazine. How much to license this to me?" Right? Um, I I I I've done this multiple multiple times with artists. I'll see something and I'll say. I see this great picture. I'd like to use it in such and such product that I'm doing, or I'm designing something for a client and they're looking for a specific image. You have this image. How much will you charge me to license this? I did this just recently last year. And uh, I think I paid $65 to license a photo. And, and then the, the creator was thrilled because uh, she had, she, had, she paints a lot and she had never sold any, she had sold paintings, but she had never licensed anything before. And when I approached her, I said, how much would you license it to me to use in this limited application uh, that we're gonna have? She was like, wow, I don't even know. And so we came up with $65, she licensed the image and we were done. It was only produced on uh, about 250 items and uh, artist was super happy. I was super happy um, and it works out. So it facilitates licensing. If you are a content creator, you do want your works out there, right? You would love for somebody to, to put uh, your, your images or your song or something into publication and to earn royalties and licensing fees from that is, is really great. So yeah, register your copyrights. So how much does registration cost? Okay, the cheapest form. And now as, as we talk today, all of this Mike. information... Yes, sir. Before you go into cost, uh, we have a comment from uh, Megan. She says, my art teacher always told me or told us to put copyright on the back of our art pieces. That's a very good advice. That's probably good advice. I would say uh, it might be more applicable to put 
TM for trademark. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, anytime I create a logo, I put TM on it uh, because that that really it's it's a it's a trademark. We register trademarks after the fact too, but copyright is is usually um, and and when we go into fees, the government's system of fees is very complex. It's like going to the IRS's website, right? Right, Juan. <laughs> Juan's our resident tax guy. Um, <laughs> when you go to the when you go to the government sites, and th these are all you, you'll find things for copyright are on copyright.gov, and we're going to talk about USPTO, the US Patent and Trademark Office.gov. That's where all of your intellectual property fees are paid directly to the US government. So it's a little complex, and they have more information on there. But here is in just in general. So for an electronic filing with one author, same claimant, one work, not for hire, it's $45, okay? Very inexpensive. Now, if you wanna register multiple works, um, registration like on the bottom here of a claim in a group of unpublished works. So you have unpublished things. You've taken a whole bunch of photos. You've never published them anywhere. You can take and say, these are Mike's photos from 2021. And you can, you can copyright the entire group of them for $85, okay? You can copyright the, the Mike's writings for 2021 and put those into something. Now, if they've been published, there's some additional price structure that's there. Please refer to the website, uh, copyright.gov for the rest of that. But I wanted to show you that it is affordable to file for copyright. It's not prohibitive. It's, it's in access for all of us to be able to file copyright on something. Okay, and as I said, copyright.gov is where you go for more information on this. They explain it pretty well, and it's it's copyright forms are not that difficult to fill out. Uh, it's probably one of the easier ones. Copyrights, copyrights and trademarks are e way easier than patents, and we'll talk about that as well. But uh, copyright.gov is where you go. We have the link on the chat. Awesome. Thank you, Juan. All right, let's talk about trademarks. What's a trademark? So a trademark is a combination. Uh, it, it could be a combination of any things that identify your goods or services or your business. It can be a word, a phrase, a symbol, and a design. It's or a combination of all those things. It's how customers recognize you in the marketplace and differentiate you from your competitors. Okay. So we have trademarks and we have service marks. So trademarks can refer to both trademarks and service marks. Uh, trademarks are used for goods and service marks are used for services. Okay. So if you're, if you're, if you want to trademark a service that you're doing, we call that a service mark and we use that in the SM at the end of that. Okay. So like I said, it identifies your, your, you are the source of the goods and services provides legal protection for your brand and helps guard against counterfeiting and fraud. We want to make sure that you're not confused with a competitor of yours doing a similar thing. Okay, so um, what this what this means is you want to be identified in the marketplace as as you. Now, if there's any confusion, if somebody starts calling another company thinking they're you, that's a problem, and we don't want to have that happen. And and legally, that should not happen. So here's a common misconception is having that trademark does not mean that you own any particular word or phrase and can prevent anybody from using it. Most people think, oh, I have a trademark. Uh, I, I, it says window cleaning in here. I can use window cleaning. No, you don't. You don't have rights to any word or phrase in general, only how that word or phrase is used to identify your specific goods and services in conjunction with your artwork around that as well, okay? So we have strong and weak trademarks. So what makes a trademark strong? It's inherently distinctive. It looks different from somebody else so that the customer can identify who you are in the marketplace. Quickly and clearly identifies you are the source of those goods and services. The stronger your trademark is, the more easily you can prevent other people from using it without your permission, okay? So if your trademark's weak, it can cost you some money, be difficult for you to defend because they don't have the same legal protections as strong trademarks. Strong trademarks can be suggestive, 
fanciful or arbitrary. Those are the three types of terms. And weak trademarks are generally described as descriptive or generic. And I'm going to go over some examples of each. So these are acceptable trademarks. These are fanciful trademarks. They're invented words, okay? Like Google is one. Here we have Exxon, Pepsi, right? Exxon is, it means nothing, right? But when we look at it, we think gas. Pepsi, we know it's a soft drink, right? But it doesn't have a meaning. The word Pepsi really does not have a meaning. These are strong trademarks because they're invented words, right? So nobody else can, can present something against them. They're probably the strongest form of trademarks that we have. Mike. Yes, sir. We have a question. Uh, does this mean you can trademark slogans? Slogans are typically a service mark, okay? Um, which, which, which says something, you put an SM behind a slogan. Right. But if you wanted to trademark, if you're going to put in artwork how it looks, like the slogan is set in a certain typeface and a certain style and a certain color, then it would be trademarkable. So giving them a special shape, special a way displayed yes. in a different way. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. And, uh, we have another participant uh, that is sharing their phrase be safe be bright illuminate at night illuminate at night i think i know who that is uh it sounds like <laughs> a poem <laughs> yeah um tip, typically that could be a, a that could be trademarked if they set it in a in a certain art form and they use that form the, the way you, the way you protect uh, against or defend your trademark is you have to use it right it's like your logo if you're not using your logo and you know a couple years down the road somebody says hey i've got the same logo you start comparing well when did you start using yours if you're in the same type of business and the same type of uh, of uh, genre of business, you could say, um, you you might not you might not have a case if you're not if you haven't been using it. So to keep your trademark strong, you have to use them. So as soon as you can start using a trademark, your logo, put the TM behind it. When you create it, once you register, you put the R behind it, just like on here with Exxon and Pepsi. Those are registered. You see the little R right here. Um, they're they're registered trademarks. So arbitrary trademarks are actual words, but they have no association with the goods or services. Okay. Apple. Apple has nothing to do with fruit, right? But what does an apple have to do with iPhones and uh, computers? It has nothing. All right. And Starbucks has absolutely, their logo has absolutely nothing to do with, and their name, Starbucks. What does that have to even do with anything? And there's a there's a mermaid. What does mermaid have to do with coffee? Those are arbitrary. Those are, those are acceptable as well, where they have no association. Now, it doesn't mean that Apple has an exclusive on the name Apple, uh, meaning that Apple can't, uh, you can't, nobody else can have the name Apple. Yeah, you can have the name Apple as long as it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't have a similar logo design and you're in the computer and or phone industry, you can't do that. You can't have a mermaid on a coffee with a coffee. You can't call it mermaid coffee and have a green logo with a mermaid like this. You would, you would get a lawsuit from Starbucks for sure, right? So you have to make sure that you're playing in your space correctly. And uh, just because Star you can have the name Starbucks if it's Starbucks uh, restaurant that might be a little, that might be in the gray area, right? Because they probably serve coffee. But if it's Starbucks insurance, could you have that? Probably. You could probably have that as long as it had nothing to do with coffee and or the mermaid. Okay. We also have suggestive trademarks. These are words that suggest some quality of the goods or services, but you, they don't state it outright. Okay. And they don't guarantee it. Craftsman tools is one, right? Craftsman, a craftsman, somebody who is well skilled at building. It, does it say that if you use our tools, you will be a craftsman? No, just it's called craftsman. That's it. Same with copper tone, copper tone, suntan lotion, right? Uh, 
Does it say we guarantee that you'll be copper toned after using our product? No, they don't say that. It's just the, it's just the name and the the logo type, and, and that is a that is an acceptable trademark. Now, some that are not acceptable are descriptive trademarks. Okay, these merely describe some aspect of your goods or services without distinguishing you from your competitors. You can't just call yogurt creamy and have that your trademark because all yogurt's creamy, right? Apple pie for potpourri. You can't, you can't do that. Why? Because it's just a, it's just a, a, a different smell of potpourri, right? And bed and breakfast registry. I mean, that's, it's, it's just describes what it is. Those are not trademarkable. So those are weak. Okay. And it'll probably get kicked out if you try to trademark those. The other ones are generic trademarks. They're not even trademarks. They're just words we use commonly every day. You cannot trademark the word bicycle. Okay. Why? Because that's, it's a word. We, we all use it. You can't, you can't do bagel shop. You can't do coffee shop. You can't do e-ticket. These are just unacceptable trademarks because they're generic. They're so generic that they don't differentiate you from anybody else. Everybody uses them. Okay. So those are unacceptable trademarks. So owning a trademark. You become a trademark owner as soon as you start using it, okay? Just like with copyright, when you create something, it's inherent. When you create a logo and you set something into recording, you establish and start using this in the open marketplace, you establish your rights in your trademark by using it. But those rights are limited, usually to the geographic area in which you're providing your goods or services. If, if I have a company called Blue let's call it uh, blue insurance agency, right? There might be a blue insurance agency also in North Carolina. There might, and you'll find this online typically because you try to register blueinsurance.com and oh my gosh, somebody else owns that. Wow, how, how was that? It's crazy. There may be 45 blue insurance agencies across the country in every different jurisdiction that all have different logos and different things, but you don't overlap. The problem is, if you're competing in the same area, there cannot be another, if there's a blue insurance agency that's here in Las Vegas, you might have some problems with using the name and the trademark of, of that name plus your logo, okay? Now you can have two blue insurance agencies if you want to. Uh, it's not trademark infringing if you both have a, let's say you both have a, uh, a blue square in there, that's a problem, right? Even if it's a circle versus a square, it still might be a problem if your if your if your logo looks similar, right? And uh, I, I saw this happen with a uh, there, there was an art school that had a certain logo to it, and they they everything was fine. They they were around the country in different areas, but they moved into San Francisco, and they're they're they opened a campus there and the art school in San Francisco, there's an older art college that had been around for like 50 years, had a similar logo. It was red. It had a similar name and uh, there was a copyright or there was a trademark infringement suit that happened. And all of a sudden one day to the next, all the logos had to be removed from this entire company because then uh, there wasn't a problem until they infringed on the geographic area of someone who had a, an older trademark in that area. So, Use your trademark as soon as possible. Put TM on your stuff and put it out there. Uh, and then once you register it, you can put an R on it, okay? So using it, just like I said, you can use TM for goods, SM for services, even if you haven't filed an application to register your trademark. So once again, it's inherent, okay? These intellectual property rights are inherent for copyright and for trademark service marks, okay? Once you've registered it though, you put the R with the trademark, you can use the registration symbol, as they say, anywhere around the trademark, but most people put it on the right bottom of it and it has to be just big enough that you can detect it, right? Cause you wanna show that it's registered. So you don't have to have it on the bottom right if it fits better on the outside of it on the left or the top, you can put it wherever you want to as long as it is around the trademark so people can distinguish that. 
So where do we register our trademarks at? If you want a stronger trademark, you want nationwide rights, right? So if you, if you have a business and you're like, hey, we'd like to expand to like 10 states, great. Go to USPTO.gov, make sure you register that trademark so that when you do expand into these other states, that um, you have a, a legal footing for doing that. So if there is someone that says, hey, I have an insurance company called Blue Insurance too, uh, but you can look at the different logos and you can distinguish between the two. You wanna make sure that your customers know which one is which. You can't have something similarly competing, so similarly competing that the, the consumer does not know. That's, that's the point of having a trademark is that you say, hey, uh, my stuff's better than so-and-so stuff. The, the, the reason we have like, uh, logos and brands. Brand literally came from back in the uh, in in the day. We'd take a brand, we'd heat it up in the fire, and it had our symbol on it, right? And we would stick it on our cow or our horse, so that that said, hey, my cows with my logo on it uh, are a certain quality that you can come to expect, right? And so we brand that in there. So. In order to use this brand, this trademark across the country, you'll have to go get registered at USPTO.gov. Mike. So yes, sir. We have a question. Uh, is there a difference between small TM and capital TM? Um, it should be capital on both of them. So just use capital. Yep. Just like the R in a uh, registered trademark, it's a capital R. That's okay. just the symbol that they use. Okay, so little details makes the difference. They do make the difference, yeah. So uh, trademark costs. There's two options, and like I said, the government's a little convoluted with their pricing structures. Uh, there is option one and option two. Option one, the minimal cost this will be is two hundred and fifty dollars per class of goods and services. Now, if you sell multiple types of things. Okay, multiple types of goods or services. It's $250 per good or service if you want to register that trademark across multiple services. Let's just assume you're doing it across one. You, you sell insurance, $250, right? Now, option two is $350. Why is it more expensive? Option number one, you pay it all up front and there's more paperwork that you do. So there's more stuff that you have to do uh, and it makes it cheaper. Option two, you pay part of it up front and part of it later and the government does a bit more of the paperwork, okay? So that's the difference in, 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 in the two of them. Please go to uspto.gov uh, just to make sure that uh, that uh, if there's any questions on this, like I said, there's, there's multiple pricing options. It explains all of this on their website, but you're looking at $250 to register a typical trademark. And it's not, it's not a hard process. You just have to do it. All right, now we're moving on to the most complex part of intellectual property, uh, which are patents. Now we've all heard of patents and uh, they, they've been established for a long, long time and they're expensive. They're the most expensive. They're the most uh, difficult to secure and to maintain. And let's talk about it. So what's a patent? A patent for an invention is the grant of a property right to the inventor. And it's issued by the United States Patent and Trademark Office, the USPTO. Generally, the term of a patent is 20 years from the date on which the application for the patent was filed in the United States, okay? Now, this is not a worldwide patent. This is from the U.S. government, okay, for the United States. So what does what rights do, uh, does a patent grant to the, the patent holder? The right to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, or selling this invention in the United States or importing the invention into the United States. So a patent does not grant you the right to this invention. A patent grants you the right to exclude others from making, using, or selling something just like yours, okay? So it's the right to exclude others. It doesn't give you the right to, to that. It gives you the right to 
exclude other people. It's, it's very interesting how that is worded, but that, that's a very common misconception. Oh, I have patents. I have a patent, which means I, I can only produce this. No, you can only exclude others from producing something like yours, okay? So what is granted is the right to make, use, offer, or sell, but not, but the right to exclude others, okay? So this, that's probably the most important thing you can remember from patents. It's the right to exclude other people from using it. Now, once the patent is issued, the patentee must enforce the patent without the aid of the USPTO. Well, wait a second, Mike. So once I get a patent, the Patent and Trademark Office doesn't like go after people for, no, they don't at all. Not at all. It's your responsibility and your cost to legally enforce and defend that patent that you have. If you don't do that, then people can infringe on your patent, right? if you don't defend it. So it's up to you to pay for all that stuff. And that's, that's a difficult pill to swallow. They're, they're hard, to, they're hard to, to file and to get, and they're expensive, and it's expensive in the process to, to defend it as well. But keep in mind, you only have the right to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, or importing that product in the United States, okay? So there's three types of patents only. We have utility patents, design patents, and plant patents, okay? Utility patents are the most common. They may be granted to anybody who discovers a new and useful process, a machine, an article of manufacture, or composition of any matter, or any new or useful improvement thereof. That's the wording right from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So did you improve something? Is it a process that happens? Um, is it a new machine, is it a, dis a discovery, an invention? That's, that's utility that has some sort of utility to it. Design patents are granted to anybody who invents a new original and ornamental design for an article of manufacture. You come up with a new shape for a bottle, okay? That's, that's a design patent. You come up with a new, uh, uh, a new styling for something. It's, it's stuff that's designed. So that's what a design patent's for. Plant patents are granted to anybody who inherits or discovers and asexually reproduces any distinct or new variety of plant. All the hybrid type of uh, fruit, vegetables, trees, plants that, that happens, you can be granted a patent for that plant. Okay, so recently we had a new apple come on the market that is a hybrid that they made. That's patented and if people want to use that, they can do it. Uh, Monsanto creates different types of seeds, right? So this genetically, um, genetic modification that happens where it talks about asexually reproducing, uh, basically plants created in a lab are able to be patented. Okay, so what can be patented? Patent law is very specific. It says that uh, the item must be useful. Okay, in this connection, it refers to that the subject matter has to have a useful purpose and also includes operativeness, which means it has to work. It cannot just be an idea. Hey, I came up with a concept for space travel. Great. Show me how it works, right? It has to work. You have to have a working prototype that's functional. That's what, that's what a patent's all about is, hey, I've created something and it's amazing and uh, it, it works. So you need to have it working. You can't have a, you cannot be granted a patent if something does not function, okay? It could be the greatest uh, idea you've ever had in the world. And we all have somebody that says, hey, I uh, had the best idea and then somebody stole it and did the, and yeah. An idea is an idea. We all have tons of ideas every day. It's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing to take that idea, to patent that idea, create a prototype, market it, sell it, and actually make a profit on it, okay? So it has to work. So what you can't patent, okay? Laws of nature. You cannot patent gravity. Just can't. You can't patent the sun, okay? Sunlight. I'm going to patent sunlight. You can't patent physical phenomena. You can't patent the wind, okay? Uh, waves. I'm not going to patent waves. You can't patent that. Or abstract ideas. Patents are granted upon a device, an invention, a process, a machine. That's what you can patent. You can't patent abstract stuff or laws of nature. 
The crazy part about a patent is you have to give total disclosure. When you patent something, you have to give the complete legal description of the actual machine and other subject matter for which the patent is sought. Here's a, here's a patent drawing. Part of a patent are drawings, technical drawings. You have to show exactly how this works. So from your prototype, you have to show what your magic is that you've, you've invented here. This is a mousetrap. How does it work? Well, there's this platform, there's this. Look at all these little drawings and numbers. These are very complex. Somebody can take, uh, somebody should be able to look at your patent, take the same thing and duplicate it very easily, okay? Now, patents can be chemical formulas, okay? Patents can be algorithms. Patents can be computer code. It, 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 anything that's there, but you have to disclose how it is. Uh, eHarmony, the dating site, actually has a has a patent on their algorithm that they use to match people up. They say that's our unique thing, but they have to they have to disclose how that actually works. Okay, so a patent only grants you the right to exclude others from doing the same thing you're doing. After 20 years, that patent expires and it goes into the public domain. People can copy it. Uh, look at uh, products like pharmaceutical products are one of the very common ones. Um, years ago, we had a product called Aleve. It's naproxium sodium. It, its patent uh, became uh, public after the 20 year period. And uh, now we get we can buy generic naproxium sodium, just like generic Advil, we can buy uh, ibuprofen. You know, if you remember, if you're old enough to remember, ibuprofen was, was never called ibuprofen, it was called Advil, right? And, uh, but once that patent expires, anybody can produce it because you've disclosed the chemical code. We know exactly how to make it because we have to disclose that. So that's one thing with a patent is you disclose absolutely everything about what it's made of, how it ticks, what makes it work. And anybody can uh, reverse engineer something, but at the same time that you're, you're given the, the magical formula to build this from scratch. So filing fees, patent costs, this is where it's, it's very complex. And I refer you to the USPTO.gov website to see all this. Basic filing fee for a patent, $320. Okay, that's a utility patent, paper filing. There's additional fees if you're going to do other filings. As you can see here, this fee structure, if you're a small entity fee, what does that mean? You have to go to their site and figure out if you qualify for that or a micro entity fee. I mean, there's all sorts of different fee schedules that are here. There's also something called a provisional patent. A provisional patent is kind of a semi-disclosure. You have to tell them kind of what your general concept is and you get a year to file your full patent uh, with that provisional. So if you have something that's, that's really groundbreaking, uh, you need to you need to file a provisional on that, and the provisional is three hundred dollars, and you end up filing another three hundred twenty dollars for the actual patent. Now, part of patent uh, the patenting process is you have to do a search to see if somebody else has actually tried to patent this product. There may be a patent out already for this, right? And uh, you may have created something. You go, oh, this is the best thing ever, and you go and you look around, and there's a patent filed on it already. Right, you came up with something very similar to what somebody else had. So, the uh, USPTO actually charges you to do patent searches. A utility search fee is seven hundred dollars to just just to do the search fee. Okay, and uh, you probably will pay an attorney or a consultant to help you do the search before you even go there. But they have to they charge you that fee as well. There's an additional fee. There's a patent examination fee. So, utility examination fee is eight hundred dollars. Okay, plant examination fee is $660. A reissue examination fee uh, is $2,320. So these costs keep adding up. So to get a patent, you really have to go through the process. It has to be worth it. Uh, if you have something that's, that's groundbreaking and protectable like this by a patent, it does make it worth it to exclude somebody from, from running with this idea for that 20 years, right? Some additional costs that you have too. It's not over yet. Remember those technical illustrations, that drawing of that mousetrap? You have to pay a designer or an illustrator to actually make these drawings that are acceptable in your patent filing. And if they're not acceptable, they kick it back out and you have to pay more fees and resubmit, 
okay? There's also legal fees for hiring a patent attorney. Usually people hire patent attorneys. And patent attorneys are very different people in general than normal attorneys, right? Patent attorneys are typically, uh, they come from technical backgrounds. They may have a lot of been PhDs. There's a PhD, uh, you, know, you have a PhD in biology or microbiology, and then they went to law school. And then you also have to sit, you have to sit for the bar exam for law school. You also have to study and sit for the patent bar. There's a separate bar exam for patent attorneys. And you have to come from a technical background to even sit for that test. So most patent attorneys are scientists, college professors. Uh, they were they were highly technical in something. They electrical engineers. They were, uh, you know, computer programmers. They were, uh, you know, botanists, uh, biologists. You know, you you name it. Uh, some, you know, some were doctors in the medical fields and things like that. Um, so patent attorneys' prices are very high because they're so specialized at what they do. And they have to, you have to have the right patent attorney for the right project. So if you have an electrical engineering uh, component to what you're trying to patent, you want to see a patent attorney that has a background in electrical engineering before they even became an attorney. Okay, so these are very, very intelligent people that they focus on one area very specifically and they, they get paid very well for it. You may also hire a consultant. So there's going to be consulting fees. Um, and then... Like I said, a patent doesn't grant you the right to, to produce the product. It grants you the right to exclude others from doing it, right? If somebody starts to do it, it's up to you to pay for that litigation on defending your patent. And if you don't litigate, they can use it and you just lose out, okay? So that was the whole reason you got the patent in the first place, but you have to prepare to, uh, to handle litigation costs for defending that patent. So a typical cost for a patent could could be anywhere from twenty five hundred dollars up to you know in the thousand over ten thousand dollars just for some basic filings and searches and when you hire an attorney and a consultant and that type of thing, but it's well worth it if you have an invention that is something that's ground shaking. Uh, I know an inventor; he is in the plumbing field, and he holds like twenty five patents. Uh, for different little things that are used by plumbers, right? And what he did is he holds the patents on these and he licenses them to manufacturers. And then every time they sell a little part or a piece, he gets 25 cents each one or 50 cents each one or two bucks or whatever. So he's a very wealthy guy because he was an expert and he was an expert plumber. And then he started inventing things to help his own, uh, his own stuff when he did plumbing. And they were so good. People were like, wow, that's great. I'd buy that, you know? And so he patented uh, his designs and literally sold them to manufacturers or licensed them and uh, collected money from that. And uh, he's a very wealthy man because of it today. So even though the costs are high, this could be very, a very lucrative thing for you if it's something that, that you can do. And when you have the patent, you don't have to make it yourself. You don't have to produce it yourself. You can license it to somebody else. If your idea is so great, and this is a, you've invented this great process that saves water, time, money, whatever, or that makes more efficiencies happen, you can license that process to a manufacturer and away you go. So like I said, all of these rules are on USPTO.gov. There's tons of information there. There's a month worth of videos and a reading material there to go through. So if you're an inventor, um, you probably are going to need help because you focus on inventing things. Uh, you'll want to you'll want to hire an attorney or a consultant to help you through this process, but you need to know the process before you you start using it. So USPTO.gov. And our last area we're going to talk about today is trade secrets. You'll you'll often hear this thrown around, but what's a trade secret, right? So trade secret is information that has actual or potential economic value, okay? Because it's not known. So it's a secret. Um, and it has to have value to others who can't legitimately obtain this information. So for whatever reason, nobody knows. So others don't know it. And it's, it's subject to reasonable efforts to maintain it being a secret, right? 
So for, in order for something to be a secret, you got to like try to keep it secret. It has to have value to others and it has to have potential economic value for being a secret. All three of these elements are required for it to be a trade secret. Okay, some trade secret examples. Uh, Coca-Cola is probably the most famous one. The formula for Coca-Cola was is traditionally held in a vault and only a handful of people know the actual formula for Coca-Cola, okay? It's been a trade secret since day one. So they don't disclose it. I think a guy reverse engineered it, you know, two, three years ago. And I think he said he came up with the formula and there were like 20 something ingredients into it to make the unique taste that we have as Coca-Cola. Um, however, uh, it's, that's been a trade secret for years and years and years. Google's algorithm on how they rank things is a trade secret. They didn't patent that. They decided to keep it as a trade secret. And that was probably a good decision. They would only get 20 years on it as a as a as an algorithm, and then anybody else could become Google, essentially. Right? The New York Times bestseller list, they have an algorithm, a formula for how they rank the books on that bestseller list. Okay, and that's a trade secret. They don't disclose how that happens. It's just a secret. So protection of trade secrets, there's a couple of laws that, that deal with protection of trade secrets. One is the Economic Espionage Act of 1996. What it does is it criminalized theft under two circumstances, okay? So it refers to the theft of trade secret intending or knowing that the offense will benefit a foreign government, a foreign instrumentality or a foreign agent, okay? So, the United States government wants to protect our intellectual property. So if a foreign, if you created some, if you have a trade secret that could help a foreign government and there's a theft of that, this protects against that, right? We don't want, we don't want our best stuff going to foreign countries, especially if it was stolen, right? The other one is the Defend Trade Secrets Act of 2016, that is called DTSA. Um, it also establishes uh, basically protections for owners that have secrets that are uniform, reliable, and it's a predictable way for them to protect their, their trade secrets anywhere in the country. So those, these two laws really protect uh, trade secrets here in the United States. So, well, wait, Mike, should I get a patent? Should I patent this or should I just keep it as a trade secret? What's, what's the difference in the two? Well, there's some differences. Patents require the inventor, like we said, you have to disclose everything. You have to tell exactly what makes this work. What's the secret sauce? It's complete opposite to a trade secret, right? Um, in exchange, you get the right to exclude others from practicing the invention for a limited period of time, right? Patents, though, uh, may protect against independent discovery. Like I said, Coca-Cola, a couple of years ago, a guy figured the formula out through independent discovery. He just did his own trial and error testing and kind of figured it out. Well, it's been over 100 years that they've kept that as a secret, right? Uh, the patents, Coca-Cola would have had to provide exactly what, how much of what ingredients were included in this if they were to patent this, this, uh, this process or this formula. Patents can also protect, like I said, against independent discovery <coughs> because you've disclosed it, so nobody's going to accidentally stumble upon it. It's there, so everybody can look and go, wow, that's a pretty cool process you came up with. You know, also patents expire. So what happens to the information in the once that patent expires, it's not protected. OK, so trade secret doesn't expire. That's how Coca-Cola has had it for so long. Patent protection also eliminates the main uh, the, that you have to keep it secret. Right. So a patent is public opposite of trade secret. So you don't have to keep any secrecy. It's hard to keep a secret. Right. So you have employees that are going to be working on things. How do you. How do you keep the secret formula together, right? Um, if it's a secret, you have to put measures into place inside your company to maintain that secrecy. All right. So trade secret costs, hey, guess what? No cost and nothing to file. Shh, it's a secret, right? Nothing to file on there. All right. So for more information, and uh, thank you for being here for our presentation today. Uh, we talked about intellectual property law, how that was given to us through our, uh, our the Constitution. Uh, we talked about copyrights, we talked about trademarks, we talked about patents and trade secrets. So for more information on this stuff, you need to go right to the source, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO.gov. 
and copyright.gov contains all the information that we presented here today. So if you have any questions on that, please, please go to that. Uh, I'd like to thank you for participating with us in our, our class today. Uh, intellectual property is something that everybody should know about, especially as a small business owner, because you create things, right? And we want to make sure that your creations are protected and that you're able to equally uh, participate in the market against uh, other people without having your ideas, concepts, logos, trademarks infringed upon or stolen. Uh, so we want to make sure that you're aware of these things in your business and that you can take your measures to protect yourself so that you can ultimately make more money and contribute more to our economy. So my name is Mike Bendrup. I've, I've been your instructor today. I'd like to thank Juan Salas for being with me as well today. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. And uh, we have some comments here. Thank you very much. Uh, a quick question. Are international patents worth getting? That's a good question. Now, remember, patents are granted from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. They're exclusive to the United States or products being brought into the United States. If uh, you're and what typically happens is somebody in another country, uh, China is a country that uh, doesn't have a high of regard with uh, intellectual property rights. So we often see American companies trying to litigate in foreign courts uh, because their property has been or their concepts have been stolen and maybe there's they're being reproduced in uh, with inferior goods or, or inferior uh, type of quality in other countries. So if your product is going to be sold in another country, it's up to you to try to go after the patent rights for that country. OK, however, if you're trying to get into China, that's a tough country to do it in. Right. Uh, some of the more developed uh, countries in uh, Europe have uh, a little more regard for patent rights and you'd have to go through the patent process just like you did in the United States, but over there. OK, so that's a tough battle to fight and a tough battle to win. But in, like I said, in certain circumstances, it does make sense to do if you have something that's that's that that good of a concept. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I think uh, we don't have any more questions. We have uh, some comments. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. And uh, we're happy that you enjoy. Thank you, Mike. Everybody have a nice weekend and uh, we'll see you next class. Thanks, everybody.